Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Christian Minute Podcast. My name is Anne Markey, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this episode. In today's episode, I'm going to be answering the question, how to pass our faith to the next generation. Most of my listeners are Christian women, and most of them are moms. And I know as a mom of three kids, One of my biggest goals is to have my children not only know the Lord, but love him and serve them for the rest of their lives. And so that seems like a pretty high standard, but I know that this is possible because I grew up in a Christian home and my parents lived their lives in a way that then I also followed in suit. And I have a great history of these like generational Christians of blessing and just how special and privileged it is to come from this legacy of faith. And so I kind of feel like it's my responsibility to pass the baton on to my children, but the path to get there hasn't always been clear to me. So the Lord, thankfully, has taught me a few things as to some specific things that I can do to pass that faith on to my children. And so in today's episode, I'm going to be sharing with you those things. Um, And not just the things that I've learned, but also some scripture to kind of help us understand how we actually practice these in our daily lives as parents. A few years ago, my dad was able to retire. And with his retirement, a lot of people asked my mom whether she was going to retire as well or not. And my mother actually loves her job. And so her answer was always until I stop loving it. But recently, she's been really focused on having the work continue once she is gone. So she works for the federal government and she helps her unit and other units in the government to write different things in plain language. Um, And there aren't a lot of standards for this. And so she was one of the only people that could actually teach people how to basically translate their work and have it at a really low reading level so that the majority of the population could read materials that the government was publishing. And so she absolutely loves doing this. And she has spent years, you know, teaching and supporting and all this stuff to different people. And so she didn't want to just leave her job and have all those years of work just be flushed away because nothing was set up to kind of have this work continue. So over the past couple of years, she's been working with a team of people to write some of these standards, to do training with people so that when she does retire, the work of plain language continues. So she loves what she does, but she wants it to go further than just her involvement with the government. And when I think about that story, I very much identify that in myself, but when it comes to my faith and passing that on to my children, as I mentioned a little bit in my introduction, I come from a rich heritage of faith. And I know you can't inherit faith, but one of the blessings and privileges that I've seen is that growing up in a Christian household, at least the Christian household that I grew up in, it puts me in an extremely privileged position because I have numerous family members that pray for me regularly. You know, there are lots of people that will tell me about some of the situations they came from growing up. And it really opens my eyes to how much more blessed I was, even though our house was imperfect, there for sure was this blessing of being raised in a Christian home. I didn't know this at the time, but after my first child was born, I had some mild postpartum depression and I had a really hard time finding my value. I felt like a milk making machine with no other use and I was really discouraged. And in those times, the Lord encouraged me and reminded me of this heritage of faith. And I don't know how far back it goes, but at least three, four, five, six generations, and not just on one side of my family, but both on my dad's side and my mom's side. And so when I think about this, I see one woman who made a decision to follow the Lord 
and she either decided to marry a Christian guy um, or maybe she had been already married before she came to faith, but then passed on that faith to her children and so on and so on. Now, I say woman just because I find stereotypically that the woman is a huge influence on the children in what they learn and the way they see and experience faith in the home. And so I have no clue if that's right or not, but that's what I vision. And then when I think about that one decision, at the time it probably felt small or there's this huge impact on her life because that means that she would spend eternity with God in heaven. And maybe she didn't even think about how many people after her this would affect in a positive way. But because this faith goes back generations, that one decision blessed countless families that could then continue to live in faith and to pass on that faith to the children, to the next generation, so on and so forth. And so there's a part of me that feels like I don't want to drop the baton. I have this huge, amazing, blessed legacy of faith. And part of me worries that I'm going to drop the ball, that uh, my kids won't follow the Lord. And sometimes it happens. And a lot of times it's not the parents' fault. So before I go into these strategies, I want to just have you understand that you could be the perfect parent and you could do all of these right things, but that doesn't guarantee that your children will obey the Lord. That th we all have individual will. And at the end of the day, each person has to decide whether or not they are going to follow the Lord or not. So this isn't a criticism. This isn't anything to make you feel guilty um, because you know, there are many people I know who didn't grow up in a Christian household who came to know the Lord. Um, and then I know of some people who grew up in Christian homes and left the faith. So you being a Christian parent or maybe not having an extremely strong relationship with the Lord, I think it does have some correlation with the faith that your children choose to have or not have, but it's not a guarantee. It's not very black and white where it says, you know, parents with faith have children who have faith and parents without faith have children who don't have faith. That is for sure not the norm. And I see a mix of those things every day. And so none of what I'm saying is to make you feel like you've somehow done something wrong. It's just observations that I've made and some of the things that the Lord has shown me that I think could be encouraging to other people. So that's my desire. Um, so please hear this with that in mind, because I would hate for anybody to hear me out and be like, oh my goodness, I'm not doing any of this. And that's not the point. That is for sure not something um, that I want people to feel. My goal is for you to hear it and to know that there is a way to share your faith with your children. And sometimes that could feel intimidating. So hopefully... By listening to this, it just feels maybe a little bit less intimidating and you just have a place where you can start. One of the things I absolutely love about the Bible is that there are some very practical verses in scripture that when we talk about sharing our faith with others and sharing our faith with our children, there are specific verses that talk exactly about this. And so this is the verse that kind of started me on this journey. And I'm going to read it. And it's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. And those verses say, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you raise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when I first read those verses, I felt really, really challenged by them. And I didn't quite understand how to then actually take all the things from these verses and then translate that to everyday life. 
But these verses emphasize the importance of actively and intentionally passing down our faith to the next generation. Now, I'm sure if you weren't having intentional conversations with your children and you weren't necessarily actively trying to do this, just living out your faith would be a huge example to your children. But I find when we come to scripture, it very much does show us that it is something that we should be doing. There are things that we can do to share that faith with our children. And we do have to be intentional about it because sometimes it doesn't really happen naturally. And so I for sure, though, have seen how it comes more natural to some and not as natural to others. And I know for myself, when I first read these verses, I needed examples. It's like, well, what do you mean like when you're sitting down? (laughs) Or like, you're telling me that when I go walk down the street with my kids, I need to be bringing up scripture. Like I didn't quite connect the two. Um, And so for me, it helps having examples. And I'm going to share a few things in this session, but I do have a few sessions coming up that will go deeper into this for you to give you some specific examples. But these verses give us a very clear instruction that says, teach them diligently to your children. So this highlights the need to put in some consistent or regular energy into sharing our values, sharing our faith, sharing what we know about God to our children. And if you're, you know, single or married without children, you can take everything that I'm t- telling you and relate that also to coworkers, friends, you know, other people's children. Um, so this isn't just necessarily for mothers. I think everybody can take something away. It's just a challenge to live our life in a way that then displays what we know about God to others and then being in an influence in their spiritual walk with the Lord. Because we talk about, you know, spiritual mothers, about you know, the people who led us to Christ. And that is for sure something um, that I've seen and that the Lord blesses as well. So this isn't just for moms. It's about anybody who wants to share their faith with other people. And the things that I'm talking about can relate to that as well. So these verses really encourage us to have these conversations about faith in our homes. And the way these verses talk about them, it's not necessarily a formal sit down at the table, read your Bible and pray together because that action is about family devotions. And I'll do a session about how to run those with your family. And that's important. But I think these verses are focusing on something else because there's a formal part of our faith, which is that sitting down and opening scripture together and going to church and going to Sunday school and kind of like how we maybe grow and learn more. But then it's also this um, informal conversations that just when we're living our lives, we share about the Lord. And an example that I really like to share is about when my children are really scared. You know, my kids hate thunderstorms and they get really petrified and scared and can really you know, start crying. And as a mom, it would be really easy just to say, like, comfort them and say, it's okay, I'm here, you're not by yourself, Um, and to give them a snuggle, and that's it. And that's a really good thing. So if that's what you're doing, that's awesome. Again, this is not a judgment call. It's just an experience that I do that I wanted to share. And I remember one time, it you know, my kids were scared, and I just felt this conviction, like, hey, the Lord can give them peace. And so I started praying with my kids when they were scared. And so I would say, oh, honey, I'm so sad that you're scared. Um, I love you so much, but let's pray. And so then we would pray and I would pray for the storm to pass or I would pray that my kids wouldn't be afraid, that they would feel the presence of the Lord with them and those types of things. And I really that was a really good way of just introducing this idea that we can turn to God with anything, whether it's our fears or our worries or all of these things that it hopefully will teach my children that the first thing they should do is to call out to the Lord. And sometimes they forget and that's fine, but I encourage them like, oh, if you're scared, like wake me up. 
because then I can lead them to the Lord because I'm probably in that moment, not necessarily scared. And it doesn't have to be this huge formal prayer. It's just really, really quick. Now, that's just been something that I've been doing with my kids when they've been a little bit older, when they understand a little bit more the concept of prayer. When they would be younger, I sang a song for them, and you probably know it, it's called, I Cast My Cares Upon You. And so when they would be afraid, I would hold them and kind of rock them, and I would sing that song for them. And just singing that song really helped them calm down. Um, but while I was singing that song, you know, internally, I would see myself in the presence of the Lord in that, like, it was really him speaking that to my children about, you know, Hey, come to me, give me your burdens. I'm here for you. I can carry them. I will help you out. Um, and so I do believe that depending on what age your child is, there may be some different things that you can share your faith. Because when my kids were younger, they for sure related to God more through songs. And so they we sang a lot of Christian songs. Um, and we had a lot of Christian music going on in our house because they really would connect with that. And they still do, but more and more as they're getting older, we're, I'm turning more to opening scripture or to praying with them because they understand that more because they're older. So it really does depend on how old your child is. Um, and I don't have a hard rule as to what age to transition from singing to praying and reading your Bible. Um, I don't even think I thought about it. <laughs> I just felt like, hey, maybe now I have space to kind of incorporate this in our lives. So let's start doing this and see how it goes. That's kind of how I run with different things. And so you can have a crack at it. And if it's really not working, you could stop and go back to singing. Um, or you can start right away with the scripture. It kind of really depends, like I said, on the kid, but also on you. Like how much space do you have to think about this? How much space do you have to like incorporate this into daily moments? And I know for everybody that might be a different point. So I don't want to give you any rules as to when you should start this. Um, just giving you some basic guidelines is to say, you know, it's really easy to be caught up in the moment and to not pray about things, but to give ourselves pause and just take a minute to bring God into these scenarios. So the past few minutes, I've been talking about actions we can take, right? Things that we can do to bring the Lord into our everyday lives. And I gave you just a really quick example. But now I want to challenge you, and this challenges me as well. Our faith can't just be lip service. It can't just be something we say. That we do need to actually act out our faith in our daily lives. And when we do that, it will be an example to our children as to seeing what a Christian life obeying the Lord can actually look like. Part of the verse that I think about is this challenge. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your strength. So when I read those words, it's not just enough to love the Lord just for one part of us. This is every single part of who we are, whether it's internal, external, our actions, our thoughts, that we have to love the Lord in all these ways. And so it does take some intentionality and it does take action on our part to then demonstrate our faith. When we start loving the Lord with our heart and our soul and our mind, this then leads us to obedience because we're looking to the Lord then for guidance and making him part of our decision making process so that, you know, he influences our actions and our thoughts and the way that we live our lives and the things that we choose to do or not do. So when you're making decisions, and maybe not when your kids are younger, because they won't necessarily understand, but when you're older, is when you're facing a life decision that you need to make, and certainly when it comes to your children, instead of just having that experience between you or maybe you and your spouse, to bring your child into the process, but then also together going to the Lord and asking for direction, or you know, when you're making plans, I can't remember the reference right now, but it goes something like, you know, don't say, 
tomorrow I'm going to do this, this, and this. But instead say, you know, if the Lord wills, we will blah, blah, blah. And I find that this small change in language is actually quite important because it just helps us understand that even though we have a lot of freedom and we can choose to do really anything, if we truly love the Lord with our mind and strength and our bodies and all those things, then we're going to want to have the Lord's direction and we'll want to do the things that he asks us to do. And I, my faith is mostly internal. I internalize a lot of things. My process is very internal. I don't always share that with people. Um, but since being married and then since having children, I've been challenged to actually share that process with my husband or with my children to just show them like what actually happens in my mind from knowing God is asking me to do something to then going and actually doing it. Or when I'm, when we're making decisions, instead of just saying, yes, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do this instead saying, Hey, let's take a minute and actually pray about it. But then if we're going to pray about it, we need to be ready to take action and actually do the thing that God tells us to do when he comes back with an answer. The next thing that you can do to share your faith with the next generation is to help your children remember who God is. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Blessed the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When you read scripture, you discover so many different aspects of the Lord and just know how wonderful he is and that it will take us eternity to get to the depths of who God is. And so when we remember the Lord, we take time to think about all those things that he has shown us in scripture. So this includes the promises of God. This includes our identity in God. This includes every single instance in scripture where God made a promise and then fulfilled it. I find in Christian circles, we focus a lot on salvation, which is really key because the w number one thing that Christ did was he came as a child to earth to live a perfect life so that he can die as a perfect sacrifice for our sins and be raised up from the dead so that we can believe in him and have eternity with him. So that is the number one thing. And so we need to remember that God has done that, that that is who he is, that he came as God in human form on earth to do this for us. But not only that, when you go into scripture, you discover so many more aspects of who God is and all the benefits we receive as his children. And salvation is just the tip of it. That even though that is the number one thing and that is the number one benefit, salvation is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more aspects of God and there are so many more benefits of being a child of God that when we start learning about who God is, it really is what brings us peace and brings us joy to worship him because you discover just how big he is, just how loving he is, just how much he's actually done for us. And when we remember all those things, it helps us grow and to have a deeper relationship with him. So when it comes to your children, you can help them remember who God is as well, right? So in moments where they're afraid, you can remind them that, hey, like God is with you. He has the power to be here with you in this moment. And it doesn't have to be this complicated thing and you don't have to share with them a bazillion things, but just to remind them who God is and all the benefits of being his children. Something else that you can do that's going to help you pass on your faith to the next generation is to help them remember what God has done for them. So throughout scripture, you will notice that there are many verses that encourage us to remember. And there's a few things that the Lord asks us and tells us to remember and one of those things is to remember what God has done for us. And so I'll give you an example. 
So when the children of Israel under Joshua's rule, they were at the edge of a river um, and it was too deep and too fast for them to cross over. And so the Lord parted the river so that the children of Israel could cross the river on dry land. And so then when they got to the other side, there are some verses that say, okay, um, a leader from each tribe, pick up a stone and put it in the middle of the river so that when you walk by the river with your children, you can point it out to them and say, hey, when we were crossing from this side of the river to the other side of the river, we couldn't go past and God did this. And so not only are you placing markers in the areas or ways that God has done powerful things in your life, but then you're using those markers to remind you about what God has done, but then to help you share what God has done with your children. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 is one of those commands and it says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Psalm 77 11 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. From the beginning of time, to the end of time, God continues to do marvelous works. And when we sit down and we remember all the things that he's done, it builds our faith and encourages us to continue to trust in God. And so our responsibility then is to not just remember what God has done, but then share that with our children. The example that we have in the Old Testament is very much about rocks. So everywhere that the children of Israel went, they either made a pile of rocks or a well or an altar. And those altars were in very specific places where the Lord had done a mighty thing. And the sentence that comes after it is that so that this would be a testament to blah, blah, blah. And so there's these markers throughout where the people of Israel were so that when they would be walking down the road and they would see those markers, they can say, hey, this is where the Lord did this. And it's very much like your parents sharing part of their lives. So I don't know about your parents, but we kind of have this running joke in my family where my dad, every single time we pass one of his old workplaces, he says, hey, that's the Harvey's that I used to work at. And because we live in the same area that my dad grew up in, he would say this every single time we pass that place. And we, we pass that Harvey's on a regular basis. So it kind of became this running joke because he would say, did I ever tell you that I used to work at that Harvey's? And now that Harvey's has actually been torn down and there's something else there. But now he'll say, hey, did you know that there used to be a Harvey's there and I used to work there? And so it was a physical marker. He wasn't using it to tell us of a time where God this, did this mighty thing, but he was using it as a marker to share part of his life with us. And that's what I think about when God calls us to have markers in our lives that as we're going through life, whether we're driving, walking, talking, sleeping, whatever, those would be reminders of who God is and reminders of what God has done for us. And that when we pass those markers, we would then share that with our children. And now for each family, this may look a little bit different, but I know for us, one of the things that we do at Christmas time is we get at least one new ornament a year. And then that ornament kind of represents something significant from that year that went on. So for example, when we bought the house that we currently live in, we bought an ornament that was in the shape of a key with, you know, our first home, the date and the address of where we are. And we have a bunch of other ornaments that represent special moments in our lives. And I, in my brain, I call it my Thanksgiving tree 
because those ornaments help me remember these events from our lives and all of them were blessings. And so when I see those ornaments, it helps me remember those moments in our lives. And then we can share that with our kids and say like, hey, this is when the Lord, you know, helped us find this amazing house. And so now our children have a bunch of our memories in the shape of ornaments and we share those memories with them every year. And now they know what they represent. They talk about them. They even, you know, share with their friends when their friends come over and they see our tree and they say, hey, do you see this ornament? We got this blah, blah, blah. And so it's really an easy way to incorporate, you know, different things that the Lord has done for us, different ways that the Lord has blessed us. Um, that is very easy to share with our kids because it's just a simple ornament because um, I've done quite a few blog posts about this and some teaching, but I really want Christmas to be more than gifts. I want it to really reflect who God is and what he's done for us and his purpose on earth. And so one of the ways we do that is by having these ornaments that are basically markers of remembrance of all the good things that you know God has blessed us with that we can easily share with our kids. And so one of the things I want you to think about is what sorts of markers can you create that you can put in a place that when you pass that marker, you can share what the Lord has done for you. Now, I know for my mom, she kind of took the rock example and this is what she does. I think with the children of Israel, they were more like boulders, like big rocks, because you would see the 12 rocks or at least the tip of it over the river because they had put it down on the riverbed and it must have been taller than the river because then they would see the marker. So she wasn't collecting huge rocks or big boulders, but just really small ones. And when the Lord answered a prayer or when the Lord does something specific, she writes a word or two on that stone and then puts those small stones in a jar. And so when she looks at the jar, she can see physical reminders that, hey, there's like 20 rocks in there. There's at least 20 times or 20 things that I've seen the Lord work in my life where I have seen the blessing of the Lord. And then when you see that, it's just a physical reminder of all the things that God has done. It builds your faith so that the next time when you're feeling discouraged or the next time maybe you have a thought like, God doesn't care about me. He hasn't done anything for me. You can look at this physical evidence and say, no, he's done A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And this long list of the ways that God has provided for you. Now, maybe you're listening to this presentation and you're thinking, yeah, I'm a new Christian. I don't have this long list of examples of all the different things that God has done. Well, now this is when you turn to scripture and you read scripture. And as you're reading scripture, you start writing down every single miracle that God did. Every single time he fulfilled a promise. Every single time he showed somebody who he was, who he is. Every single time God has done anything miraculous, because if you do that, and if that's just the one purpose you have while reading scripture, that then becomes your list of evidences until you start having your own evidences. And then you can use both because we do want to have this habit of going back to scripture and seeing all the things and learning more about God, because then we learn different aspects of who he is, the different things that he can do. Um, but then pairing that with specific ways that he has done that personally, because sometimes it could feel like God is a far off God. I know he's powerful. I know he worked for the Israelites. I know he did this and this, but then sometimes we have a hard time relating that to ourselves in our own lives. And I think that's pretty normal. So I think it's important to kind of have those two things in our brains, like all the ways he fulfilled promises in scripture, 
And then also, once we start seeing God's fulfillment of promises and provision in our lives, having those things as well. So we're not just depending on our feelings or things that are happening in our lives, but also being based in scripture. So just this habit of remembering specific times where God has provided for you or where he has shown himself to you so that you know he's real. And then what, thinking about ways you can naturally share those things with your friends, your children, whomever. One of the other things that you can do to share your faith with your kids is to have visible reminders of faith in your home. So like I said, you could either use physical markers in your home, like my mom has actual rocks. The Deuteronomy verse was talking about like when you hang these things on your walls and I kind of take this very literally and say, oh, I can hang God's word on my wall. So in our home, right at the door entrance, we have a verse from Joshua and it says, as for me in my home, we will serve the Lord. And um, I just added another cross stitch to my collection that has a verse on it that's on our fire mantle and you can just see the bottom of the frames behind me but those are actually three different scriptures that I have that I printed out that I hung on my wall and they say faith hope and love and verses that represent each and so we can see them on a regular basis so sometimes I have a hard time sitting down and reading scripture every day and so having verses on the wall helps me meditate on it at least once a day so that if I'm not having like a more formal devotional time with the Lord, there are still verses around my home that I can read in different spots that it can help me think about the Lord in different ways. And then, you know, I feel like sometimes some Christian homes you walk in and you're like, oh my goodness, it's everywhere. And that's completely fine. Um, but that's not what I wanted. So it's only like a few things in specific areas. And so really it's up to you to think about, okay, are there verses that mean something to me that I can hang in specific areas of my home so that when I'm feeling discouraged or when I'm lacking faith, I can read those verses and be encouraged. I know that for many, many years, my grandmother, she was a very strong faith. She had time with the Lord every day. She was a warrior, but she would then pick a verse for the year and she would handwrite it on cue cards and send, uh, you know, send the verse of the year to each of her grandchildren. And so then I would hang those cue cards on our fridge and that would be the verse that represented that year. And she did this until maybe, oh, I forget how many years it was, but um, she was starting to lose her memory. And so there was a point that she stopped before she died just a few months ago. Um, but just that you can put these verses on your fridge, in the kitchen, living room, dining room, bathroom, wherever you're going to be, that you can just quickly look up. You see the verse. It's an encouragement. It's a visible reminder of God's word. It's a visible reminder of who he is. And it's also just a visible sign to like to visitors that you read scripture so that when you have people who enter your home, maybe they're not saved and maybe you're a little bit shy about sharing your faith these small visible reminders tells them that you read scripture. And so they kind of help you testify about God just by hanging on your walls. So I'm sure there's a bazillion other things that we can do to share our faith, but I just wanted to give you a few examples. And I know that many of you probably want to dig a little deeper and have just a few more examples for you to do. And so next week in our next session, I'm going to be giving you 10 Christian parenting tips for raising godly children. So if you want to hear more tips, I really encourage you to tune in next week because I'll be sharing that. And if you are looking for some resources to help you have a more Christ-centered home, you can grab the free Christ-centered home bundle that I have right now. This is a collection of 32 free 
products to help Christian women establish a strong foundation for their family spiritual life and cultivate a home environment that honors God. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in and you want to learn more about it or you want to grab your free bundle, you can go to www.onedeterminedlife.com forward slash bundle and get your free bundle today. Thank you so much for joining me today and I would love for you to just leave a comment, let me know, give me some more examples of ways that you've shared your faith with your, with your children just to give everybody more examples of what this can actually look like in our lives. I really appreciate you taking the time with me and I'll see you next week. Bye.